loving husband, a devoted dad. But John was battling the bottle, and he was losing that. Stumbled in one day, asked his daughter to play. She looked up and said, Daddy, I don't like you this way. As tears ran down her face And in that moment He knelt at her side He said, I'm sorry For making you cry He never touched The bottle again That's what happens when love But um, the founder of IKEA passed away this last weekend. Um, I can't say his name. And not like I, it's a secret, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> but yeah, and the worst part was during the funeral watching the family assemble the casket. <laughs> uh, was, like, they were having trouble too. It was part A, part B. My virginity at an IKEA. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I haven't lost my virginity. <laughs> You know, I'm getting old. I have to get, give up on the, those great, crazy, romantic ideals of love, you know? And I guess if I give up sex, you know, I can still have food, right? That's kind of like sex. It's like, and it's always there when you want it anyway, and it's kind of like satisfying. And, and did you ever go on a diet, or maybe not even on a diet, and then you have some food that's so good that you go, oh my god, oh my god, like a really good pizza or chocolate molten lava cake or something, and you go, oh my god, it's so good, so good, I haven't had it so long. It's so good. I call that a carb gasm. <laughs> I, I have a lot of the books. So in the wake of all these school shootings, uh, you know, it's terrible, and it's got to stop, and... Some people think we should arm people in the schools, and the NRA came out with a list of uh, acceptable weaponry for people who work in schools. You want to hear it? You guys are so exciting. <laughs> Teachers, close quarters, going to need a submachine gun. Librarian, it's obvious, isn't it? Silent. Silencer. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. I was, I was kidding, that was part of the joke. <laughs> Gym teacher, duh, flamethrower, feel the burn! <laughs> Janitor, janitor's got a clean shit up, so he just gets a t-shirt gun. Nobody really trusts that fucking guy. <laughs> you seen a janitor? Yeah, don't give him a gun. Tonight, with breaking news in the West, the sudden death of Robin Williams. The Marin County Sheriff's Office in California says the comedian and Academy Award winning actor was found dead at his home there today, apparently a suicide. Williams' spokesman said he had been battling depression. Williams was 63 years old. John Blackstone has details. It was just before noon today that emergency responders were called to Robin Williams' home just across the bay from San Francisco. Williams was found unconscious and not breathing, pronounced dead at the scene. While the investigation is not complete, a statement from the county sheriff's department says the coroner suspects the death to be a suicide due to asphyxia. Williams press representative Mara Buxbaum said the comedian has been battling severe depression of late. Williams' wife, Susan Schneider, said in a statement, the world lost one of its most beloved artists and beautiful human beings. Lucky, spoiled, and gluttonous country. I was in a restaurant recently, the waitress says, hey, did you leave any room for dessert? Did you leave any room for dessert? Did you leave any room for dessert? How gluttonous a concept is that? Did you leave any room? Is there more space in your fat, distended, bloated body cavity for more? Any chance you can put more in there? Is there any room, any space? Is there any possibility for more being crammed in your fat head? Any chance at all, any room? We got dudes with plungers that'll come out and cram food in your bloated esophagus. That was the late Greg Giraldo, who died this past autumn after an accidental overdose. Joining me now is Greg's wife, Marianne McAlpin, Geraldo, or Geraldo, and Greg's good pal, Colin Quinn. All right, let's talk about Greg for a minute. Now, sure. he suffered from depression. What, what, 
Was he self-medicating, do you think? Because he did have an overdose on prescription medication, I understand. Right. Uh, I, I think so. He definitely struggled with depression. Hmm. And I think he used alcohol to and other things to, to help him with that. A lot of people do that. Yeah. You know, what convenient. happened that he that he passed away from it? Too much. Yeah. A lot of people exactly. try. And they mix things up and yes. That's too bad. And I think it, when you do that for so many years, obviously it doesn't get better with years. It gets yeah. worse. It's so it's so heartbreaking that such a funny guy. Yeah. Too. We hate to lose comedians. Right, Colin? That's right. Whenever I hear a comedian dies, a little something in me dies. Actor and comedian Robin Williams shocked the world. Yeah, our next guest knows that all too well, um, that, and that many comedians are, in his words, broken. So joining us now is Jim Ralph. He started the Comedy College here in Milwaukee. He has also written a couple of books that deal with mental health and addiction. Great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks Great for being to here. be here, but how do you follow Rob? Yeah. I mean, really. <laughs> Take your shoes really. off, stay away. Let, exactly. let the family guy that's trapped. <laughs> but the first thing I want to say is, honey, get in your car and get to these dumpsters. Yeah. Like, now, like, what, are we doing? Like, what are we doing? But yeah. I need to get a selfie first because oh, yeah. I've never selfie. been with a Miss in. Minnesota <laughs> and the person that was the best typist in her class. Yeah, that's true. Oh, you were watching just, the show yesterday. That was crazy. Yeah. But you kind of threw me when you started doing the one finger thing. And yeah, like, I know. I'm like, I'm what kinda, am I doing? I'm kind of doubting you. Yeah, I, re I reminded myself that I had to have my like proper setup, mm -hmm. but it, it took me a little For bit. I'm so help. used to texting. <laughs> For my right. wrist help. Mm -hmm. um, good to see you. How did you react to, what was your initial reaction when you heard about Robin Williams? Uh, I'm guessing that you weren't necessarily surprised. Or well, were you? No, I was shocked. I was hurt. It was painful. Yeah. Um, my son texted me while I was doing a health walk at uh, Mayfair mm -hmm. Mall, and it just was shocking, and I went to bed that night, and I saw in the news asphyxiation, and I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, I'm like, man, did he hang himself, you know, and it was just like so, you know, I don't want to believe that part of it, mm -hmm. uh, couldn't get back to sleep, and uh, it really shattered me. It really did, and uh, but I, I'm no stranger to depression. Uh, that's how I got into comedy. That's how I started the comedy college. Uh, it's been here since 1999, and uh, I have some classes coming up. If you want to heal, or if you think you're the next big thing, you know, come check me out. I'll be having a class in September, so. And your first class is always free. Ooh. Yes. Well, what do you it think is. about you. The, the dichotomy of that, you know, the, the clown who wears the mask to cover their pain, you know? I think that's what, you know, has been so much in, in the conversation right now of how can somebody who's so funny, who spends their life making other people laugh and entertaining others and being so generous and kind and giving struggle with so much pain when they're so loved? I think it's, you know, deep down, I just think it's it's more about when that camera's on and being a show and you're your product and, you know, the, the your public self and your private self mm -hmm. are just two worlds apart. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's you, true. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like comedians um, or people who struggle with depression seek out? Comedy? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, I get two types of people. Uh, some people that are told by their friends that you're really funny, you should go check out that class, you're the next best thing. I get people that come in that think they're the next best thing. <laughs> um, and then I get people, there was a guy in Chicago, one of my Chicago classes, he said, I walked out of the courthouse after my divorce, I saw your flyer on a light pole and said my wife always wanted to be a comic. And I'm going to beat her to it. So there was this pain <laughs> and anger. And, you know, comedy is a great place to get rid of that stuff yeah. and, mm -hmm. and dump it. Yeah, yeah for sure. True. So. Yeah. Why did you, um, you entered into this AODA, the Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Counseling. Why is that? A passion. Because I was working with these people. I could see they're broken in my class. We go through the six-week thing. And by the seventh week, we do a show, and then these people would be hugging me after the performance and saying, you changed my life. Mm -hmm. And that felt so good. I'm like, why should I just do this at nighttime? Let's do it all day long. The wellness wheel. And okay. the wellness wheel is something I learned about at helping people with mental health issues at well, the, Grand, the Grand Avenue Club yeah. in Milwaukee. Okay. And uh, I had to give a speech there 
I was a wellness coach and they wanted me to get more people to come upstairs in their fourth floor and I came across this. In the so what are the categories for? It's physical, spiritual, intellectual, financial, career, social, emotional, and, and environmental. Are these the areas of your life? These are the dimensions of our lives, mm -hmm. yes. And so most of us are, the idea is if all these things are in balance, we should roll through life like a wheel. Yeah. But most of us are eggs. <laughs> so we're really strong in some areas and not so strong in others. So I wrote this book called What Color Is Your Brain Scan? Huh. The answer is in your head and hammocks. I, I would yeah. suspect that, well, something I learned at MATC is that when alcoholics or drug addicts or people that are depressed come in for a brain scan, their brain literally looks like it's not functioning. Right. And then as time goes on, it gets better. And, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in the field, but I think if you looked at Robin Williams, it probably wasn't firing on all cylinders. He had a relapse. And I'm just going off of speculation yeah. uh, of what I heard, uh, that it probably wasn't so bright and colorful. Uh, the book has a self-assessment self in it, mm -hmm. so you can see what areas you're strong in. If you're strong in those areas, then you can ignore those areas and focus on that. So that's what this is it's about. It's great yeah. information. I know um, the, the Comedy College right now, you've got stand-up classes that start Wednesday, September 24th. So if you're interested in learning more about stand-up, giving it a try, maybe you've just got some good stories you want to tell, you can learn how to format them. Here's the information for a class that starts on Wednesday, September 24th. It's at Rounding Thursday standupcomedy101.com the first night is always free and again um, you, where can people find your book uh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble's website Great. if I could plug this really quick I, I wrote this for mothers or mm -hmm. people that struggle with addiction it's for an adult to read with children okay um, I'm, I give them away mostly uh, and where do if, people get those uh, Amazon or uh, it's great yeah, right but it, do you, they search under hashtag Amanda um, just my name. Okay. Just go under Jim Roth, Google okay. it, and the stuff and you'll start. it's R-A-U-T-H. Correct. Yeah. Great to see you today. Cool. Thank you Thank so much. My name's Jim Roth, and I started at the Comedy College in 1999, uh, basically by putting these flyers all over the city of Milwaukee and Chicago over the past 19 years. But I want to read, read you something off of my phone because I could not get this to print off. So I'm gonna read this, and it really reminds me of doing stand-up comedy. Let's see here, there's such an attraction, such a high. The experience is a rush and pleasure and prolonged sense of euphoria, as well as increased energy, focus, confidence, sexual prowess, and feeling of desirability. And I just read you what methamphetamine does to people. But actually, that was my experience when I started doing stand-up comedy. I started in 1999. I got on stage, um, did a lot of drugs as a kid, always trying to fix myself. I think I was born depressed or had a lot of trauma come against me very, very early in life. And... You know, so I found drugs and alcohol. Like, I was alcoholic by the time I was 12, 13. And so what was good about that experience, if there is such a thing, is that I was so out of control so quickly. By the time I was 18 or 19, I had to quit drinking and using drugs because I spent a lot of time in jails, uh, car crashes. Uh, by 28, I lost a lot of friends to addiction. And when I did stand-up comedy, what I just read you was what meth and phenamine does to people. And so I have this theory that comics um, kind of come in, a lot of us with depression, and we're trying to have our brains stimulate it. We don't even know this. I don't even think we're aware of it. But that laughter gave me everything that was described in that rush from methamphetamine. And here's the other thing about that. I have a theory. This is what happens to your brain after you do meth for a long time. Meth in the brain. Meth releases a surge of dopamine causing an intense rush and pleasure or prolonged sense of euphoria. Over time, meth 
destroys dopamine receptors, making it impossible to feel pleasure. Although the pleasure centers can heal over time, research suggests the damage to users' cognitive abilities can be permanent. Now, my theory is that a lot of guys and Rodney Dangerfield in his book talked about how he could not even hear the laughter anymore in the end because I think, for me, laughter's been this drug that I haven't used it as much as these guys and I haven't blown out my, my uh, system that produces dopamine yet. I, my dose of comedy is I definitely need one night of good hard laughter uh, to keep me in check with a good antidepressant. And also, probably a second I'm heading towards, I haven't quite blew it out yet. I'm hoping in my lifetime I don't. Um, but anyways, that's my theory. I think a lot of us comedians, you know, comedians, it's such a small group of people. We're talking 10,000, 20,000 in America. And look at all the people that have passed away that. And these are the greats, you know. These are the ones that we know about. What about Joe Smith in Iowa that we, you know, goes out and does comedy? in 1999 uh, after taking a class myself you might have read on the table some people have been having some success um, I tell all my students I don't know if it's 999 out of a thousand or 9999 out of 10,000 would never step on this stage so are you gonna show them some love tonight yeah. uh, three people going up to the stage for the very first time if you're here to support them uh, make some you know, give them a little extra special love. I had my first kiss the other day. I liked it. I don't know how my uncle felt about it. Glasses, white beard. Well, let me assure you, it's not easy being a sexy bitch. Yeah! I know. I've gotten a bro hug from a woman. <laughs> Believe me, nothing says more that you're not getting laid than a bro hug from a woman. <laughs> All right. I'll tell you the, a little bit about myself. I'm uh, 57 years old. My mother, she uh, she just turned 79, and now she's telling me that uh, it's time that I should start acting my age. So I went into cardiac arrest. <laughs> now we're coming to the point of the show to see your friends. Are you guys still ready? Are you still going to show them some love for me? <laughs> all right, this is not easy. Uh, so keep that in mind, all right? You know, Jerry Seinfeld, when he does, when Jerry Seinfeld does a new series, it takes them a year to do 60 minutes. So it's difficult, you know? Absolutely, he's laughing. No, it's serious. Uh, so it's very difficult to write comedy material. But anyways, are there some George Nyrider fans here? Right.
then after a fight with my ex, I went out to a bar, had a couple drinks, started feeling sorry for myself. I looked around and there she was, depression. <laughs> she understood me. She accepted for me for my sadness. <laughs> Soon, she asked me not to hang out with my friends, happy and joy, and to start hanging out with hers, dejected and moody. Well, she knew it wasn't going to last. Yeah, the writing was on the wall. We had problems. So we went and got counseling. And then I started taking meds. It was a messy ending. Yeah, she caught me cheating with attention deficit disorder. <laughs>
and they've been to war in Iraq or Afghanistan, what you'll find is that the childhood trauma supersedes the problem with war. And so I think this group of people has definitely underutilized their brains, uh, that feel good part. And so what I'm doing is I'm gonna put my theory in action and we are gonna be putting out these signs and I'm offering veterans a free stand up comedy class. And we're gonna run these all around the city. We're gonna put them over by the VA hospital here right across the street and put my theory in action because I do truly believe that laughter is the best medicine. And so we're gonna get out there, we're gonna put these around town and hopefully I can get a class together. Now we're trying to reach, very few people wanna become stand-ups. And so if I can pull this off, it's gonna be a miracle that we can get people in here to come and do some stand-up. But what you're gonna find when we do this is that these people will come in and after the seven week program, they're gonna talk about how good they're feeling. Watch when they come in, they're gonna be down, depressed, and by the end of this thing, we'll have them laughing back on their feet. And there's that saying that laughter is the best medicine because laughter is a truism. And so we are gonna get out there and then in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna hope to have this class going. So you said you're on this park bench in Washington, D.C. How did you come to know that you were schizophrenic? Well, um, I, when I, you know, I, I had been, when, I, when I went to D.C., I was about 26. I knew that there was something wrong when I was about 23 because I began to hear voices. I began to, the TV began to talk to me, right? And everybody, if you were... If I, if you were within, if you were within eye distance from me, you could be across the street, and in my mind, my mind's eye, you're talking about me. There was something there that you're talking about. Me. So that was a little different, you know. And I can remember my parents, uh, my mother particularly, saying, "You are you on drugs?" At the time, I wasn't. At the time, I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't even drinking, right? Because I understood that that agitated things, and um, you know that's kind of what happened. Bob Curry, Mr. Curry, he, he which is the founder of Dry Hooch, he came back here and he um. He suffered from PTSD, but he didn't know it. Back then, it was called shell shock. Okay. okay? And he went through years and years of drinking and alcoholism. And um, I guess about 15 years ago, um, he was involved in an accident on his way home. He lives in Dosman, not too far from here, up north, not too far from here, or west, I'm sorry, west. But um, as a result of that accident, uh, he ended up in court. You know, and uh, uh, he got found not guilty because of a, 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 a fellow died that night, and Bob had been drinking. And uh, my understanding is that um, he went to jail, and a whole bunch of vets got him out, and uh, 
Fast forward, he got found not guilty by reason of insanity through PTSD. Up comes Dry Hoosh. That was the mission to help guys transfer back into America from overseas. He says moving forward that uh, he would never let that happen to younger vets. So that's what Dry Hoosh is about. And what we do today is we actually do help guys transitioning back into, into society. Um, you, you can pretty much imagine a guy 17 to 18 years old leaving here and going overseas being dropped in the country he doesn't know anything about him. and then come back. He's going to come back different. There's no question about that. What was the precipitating event that you went from the bench to treatment? Um, event. Prison. Prison, um, I think, um, kind of uh, got me there, but then when I came out of prison, I went straight to rehab at the VA hospital. You know, so um, that space now is filled up with uh, the process of recovery. And the thing is, is that whenever you're addicted to heroin specifically, you bond with it like you would be bonding with individuals. So, you know, you have to reverse that. You have to learn how to bond with human beings, okay, which is a process. However, um, giving yourself, having patience with yourself, a little bit of self-discipline, um, you'll find that purpose is a lot more satisfying than any substance, <laughs> okay? So that's where you gotta be at. You gotta understand that part, you know? So what's your purpose? Well, you know, for me, uh, my purpose is, um, and I work on my purpose all the time, is helping other folks. Me and you, we did some comedy a couple of weeks back. I came in and we we were right. throwing imaginary balls around and that sort of thing. How was that experience for you that day? Oh, it was great. You know, I think that um, um, the exposure and the exercises we did allowed me to see um, what I would see when I'd watch stand-up comedians and how that whole process worked, a little piece of it anyway. and. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I did it with my wife. I did it with a lot of people, a little exercise, a little ball. I tell a person, okay, you take your ball, it's a little red ball, it's about this big. Oh, okay. So you've been oh, doing sure. it in your groups now, or what? A little bit. Yeah. I'm do it with him. Okay. okay. Yeah. Listen, All right. I got a ball in my hand, okay? It's a red ball, okay? And it's a ball, it's right here. It's about this big, right? I want you to catch it when I throw it to you. Okay? You're not, you, you're not gonna catch it with your hands full. Yeah, 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 your hands gotta be your hands gotta be you ready? Watch. Ready. I'm gonna throw the ball to you. Alright. Now you're gonna throw it back to him. And say red ball first. Oh, what are you throw so high for? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna say red ball, okay? You ready? I'm gonna throw it back to you. Red ball. Red ball. Red ball. Red ball. Okay, now listen, now listen. Stand up, I'm gonna throw it far to you. Okay, you ready? Try to throw it right here. Red ball. But you gotta catch it for, whoa, don't know he can get his face so hard. What are you doing? Okay, let's try it again. But don't throw it so hard, okay? You okay, 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 okay. just reacted. Uh, okay. okay, I'm gonna throw it to you easy. Red ball. Red ball. This is one of the exercises that you showed me, right? And not even in groups, I do it all the time now. Yeah. I mean, somebody, cool. But that's like when I know them, you know? <laughs> so well, I got a lot more than that. Yeah, you know, I got a lot more yeah. than that. So, but, um, so <coughs> I, I want to ask you a couple of more questions about uh -huh. the comedy piece. Um, so, the reason why I wanted to focus on coming here, mm -hmm. and I have a theory. Okay, and I believe that laughter is a medicine, Yeah. but it can also be a drug. Like I believe that Robin Williams overused, it's like a meth addict, he right. overused that feel good thing. Right. And I've heard this from comics that are super successful, mm -hmm. that they can't even hear the laughter anymore because anytime they say anything, they just get a laugh. So it's like they don't have to work for it anymore. So do you think because I think it's a drug in my life because I cope with depression. Mm. 
And I like the word cult now because I didn't ask for depression. My thyroid don't produce enough serotonin in my brain. So um, I like to say I cope with it because I didn't ask for it, I just have it. And so laughter is a big part of that for me. When I go out, it's a big medicine. And I don't think there's been a group of people that have been more traumatized than veterans. And so do you think that a program like this, and they don't have to be stand-up comedians. You know, I just, that's just how I fell into this because I wanted to go around 15 years ago and I put up a thing like laugh therapy class and I think everybody thought I was crazy at that time. Mm -hmm. But I knew it was doing something for me. Right. Do you see a benefit with veterans being able to play games like this and reconnect yeah, with know. emotion. Laughter. You know, it probably is for the immediate release of endorphins. Yeah. I think that you got something there. Unlike, this is the difference. Unlike Reiki or acupuncture or Zentangle or um, there's another one that Anyway, mindfulness, or yoga for that matter, even though some of these things you can actually do by yourself, they're better in a group. See, laughter is something that you can generate within yourself, by yourself, for other people too. Sure. So once you understand, I think once a vet could understand how beneficial it is, then it becomes almost like maybe second nature, yeah. as opposed to feeling indifferent toward whatever it is that's going to lead him into a trigger. decide you're going to walk in the recovery. Why did you do that? I, uh, I felt like I had nowhere else to go. I was, I was just lost. Uh, in fact, I, uh, you know, I stopped right over here at my dad's grave in the military cemetery. And I'm talking to his grave is telling me. And, uh, Yeah. You know, part of me is thinking I'm crazy because I'm talking to a gravestone. And uh, part of me, I'm just, you know, I'm reaching out for something. Just, just reaching out for something to help me. Because, uh, I don't know, I wanted that, uh, I wanted to feel better. You know, I just wanted that one last high. I wasn't getting it, and uh, I knew I needed to do something else. And I actually, uh, I called my aunt from there, and my cell phone, I don't even know if she could hear me. But, uh, I just said, you know, I, I need help, you know, what can I do? So I, you know, I reached out to the just for today club. <laughs> uh, that was a Saturday actually. I went and uh, I parked outside and I couldn't go in. Because I, I had actually been there maybe a month or two before. I had been there two months before. And I did go in and I didn't want to I didn't want to tell them, hey, I, I failed, I, uh, I fell off, I went to using again, and uh, I, don't know, I left from there and I had my last, uh, my last beer, and my last beer, and I, re 
return the next morning, Sunday morning or afternoon. And that was hard too, because I was supposed to have my kids. And I made that decision that, uh, you know, I, I promised my aunt, you know, that I'd go there the next two days and I missed Saturday. So uh, I went that Sunday, it was the first day. You know, I remember everyone that was there on my first day. And uh, one thing that really offends me is the N word. I do not like the N word. I'm not. I don't want to say that 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 word. And I talked to, to Jim as well, and I, he, I can't say the R word. I'm not going to say that. You know, I want to respect people. And and uh, but I I am going through a, a divorce, and and you know the words are getting thrown back and forth. And uh, you know uh, you know I'm calling her a bitch, and she's uh, you know she's calling me names, and she's saying I'm going against the you know. Uh, going back on my promises, you know, that I made promises to her. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that I reneged on my promise. She's, you know, she's saying, saying I reneged on the promise that I'm a renegger, you know. And I, I don't like that word, renegger. I, you know, she, she, of course, she knows I know I don't like that word, so she keeps using that word, you know, saying that I'm a renegger. And, uh, uh, I didn't mean to offend anybody, but, <laughs> uh, and of course it's not funny, I mean, I guess it's, uh, I don't know, not necessarily funny, it may be uh, funny things happen to me, uh, you know, I got a few stories that I think are a little funnier. All right, hold up though, we'll, we'll talk a little bit. Okay, good. I still don't want you to start with that joke. Okay, all right, all right. I'd rather have like the tooth state joke first, maybe. Okay. Uh, is there any point where you're going to talk about yourself, like things you like, things you don't like, anything from that? Or, but anyway, I want to talk on this joke. Okay. So the joke you're just doing, I really like the way you're presenting things. You're very presentational, uh, conversational, not presentational. I like it. You got good, uh, you light up when you're talking. That's great on, uh, in stand-up. I was always taught you want to be yourself times 10, you know, you come up, you don't want to be so over the top, like sometimes I'll get students that'll run up on stage and they start dancing, they notice the audience is digging it and they like it, but they do it so much they can't even talk at the end, so I, I don't need energy so far off the top, but you got really good energy. One thing I noticed is you keep stepping backwards a little bit, Okay. and I'd rather have you just kind of relax, stay more in one spot. and. But you like tell a joke and then you'll step back a little bit. Just just stay there. You know, just this is what's happening with me. So if you practice this on video or you practice in front of a mirror, just be conscious of that. So do you like coming to work with Dad? Yeah, um, we actually have no choice. He just brings us to work. Do you? Yeah, I like it. Do you like coming to work with him? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was kind of fun. You got to play in the gym. Do you get to do that often? Yes, yes. Wow, that's We get to play almost every day, but sometimes Daddy doesn't have work. And we get to spend time with him at the park. Oh, you like the park too? Well, that looked like the park a lot. Yeah, and you know? parts have slides and ladders. Yeah. And all kinds of stuff. So what are all your duties here? What are... just, uh, just sweep out the classrooms as needed. There's maybe a couple rugs to vacuum. Um, 
during cold and flu season, you want to wipe down some of the surfaces uh, to stop the spread of germs. So I wipe it down with like a plant-based disinfectant. I grab the garbages and recycling. So what's it like, Ben, being a single dad this last year? Uh, it's it's taxing, uh, trying to make the time to, to get work in and uh, pick the kids up from school on time and uh, get them ready in the mornings. And, uh, so. and I see I have them here tonight, so, I mean, being a single dad, you know, there's a lot of complications, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, you know, we can have some fun in the gym sometimes or playing hide and seek throughout the school and, and that, but... Uh, you know, I got to make sure I get everything done and clean you know, by the morning so that the principals and the head janitors aren't uh, yelling at me. Or... I noticed there was another person here with you tonight, uh, another gentleman. Who is that? Uh, Rich, he's an, uh, he's an old friend. Uh, old, uh, old friend, I know him since, I, like I say, I was 19. Uh, so that's like 25 years. And, uh, he needed a job, so uh, kind of helped him out here. Hey, sweetie pie. Daddy. Daddy. Yes. Daddy. I'm looking for you. Yeah. What's up? So. I just wanted to be with you. Okay. So he's a co-worker and. Yeah, co-worker and a roommate and. Uh, Yeah. Unless you have the camera by the office. Yeah, I know, and I didn't shut it off either, but that's okay. It's yeah. just I thought you would filming there. Do you want to go grab that left? one? Yeah. Sure. Can I'll you bring back. it back? All right, cool. So when you were um, a young kid, um, I know your father passed away. Can you talk to me about those uh, details and how that affected your life at that time? Yeah. Um... Yeah, you know, I was uh, I was 13 when he uh, when he was killed uh, by my stepmother's uh, boyfriend, and uh, it was down in Texas. I uh, I never uh, never got to see anyone go to jail or be punished for that, and that uh, you know that made it really difficult. Um, Is it a cold case or something, or? No, it's just, uh, she, uh, she was his wife, but she may have, she may have called him down, down there, we don't know. And, down to where? Uh, down from Oklahoma into Texas, and, uh, she, uh, she went away with her, uh, her manager with her restaurant manager and uh, you know he went to pursue his wife my, my dad went to pursue my stepmother and uh, in Texas if uh, <clears throat> if you uh, if you go to someone's house if you go to someone's house and they feel threatened Uh, you know, calling to, to try to get some revenge on, the, on their cheating, or if he was called into the apartment, uh, but uh, he, uh, you know, he tried to he tried to enter their house, and, uh, and he was shot. To, he was shot down three times in the chest with a 357. You know, that made it hard too because my dad was a big guy, he was a 6'5", 350, Marine sergeant, and you know, always a big strong guy. I was the last one to give him a hug before he left, he left Oklahoma to go down to Texas. And uh, I'll never forget that hug actually.
how did you how do you think during those days how did you feel at that time um, and I felt completely destroyed I didn't know how I'd live my, uh, my uncle Jimmy actually uh, saved me at that time Uh, you know, sitting with my big Rambo knife, just kind of contemplating, and uh, and he walked in on me. Talk to me about the home bridge. Yeah, that was uh, that was when my wife uh, left and left for Ohio, and I just felt uh, I felt like I, I didn't have any. I felt like I didn't have anything left, you know. My uh, I thought my wife and my kids were my everything, and. Uh, uh, just, you know, being under the influence of uh, the alcohol just, it brought me down. I just, uh, I didn't see any hope. So you got in your car and you drove to the tallest bridge in Milwaukee. And then what happened? I stood at the top of the bridge and I, I looked down. I don't know, it was amazing, a, a huge uh, wind came up at that moment, uh, a really strong wind, uh, and uh, I almost felt like if I jumped that, uh, that it would carry me, that uh, although I wanted to die, that it sort of woke me up in a way, sobered me, and I, uh, and I turned around, I just went back to my car, um, thank God for that. Well, Tony, we're on our way to your first gig. How are you feeling about tonight? Um, well, <laughs> I'm completely unprepared, uh, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. I know, uh, I know uh, some of my material. And, uh, like I say, it'll give me a, a, a jump-off point. I can sure. see, uh, you know, gauge. I know, I'm not prepared, so that's, that's not really that's okay. Yeah, you know what, though? I'm going to tell you, number one, uh, I just heard the sleep thing. That's pretty normal, you know, that you would be restless your first time up. Being unorganized or not prepared, every comic, when they walk up to that microphone, they always say, I wish I could have, like, five more minutes. So, <laughs> okay. did you get a... Yeah. So did you get to run through the material or? Yeah, uh, yes, I, I, I've done some run throughs, I guess, uh, you know, I, I was balancing on uh, you know, what I should try to start with. Um, you know, you had mentioned the you know, uh, show of hands, you know, how many people are, are from Wisconsin. Yeah. I was also thinking of, uh, you know, seeing, uh, you know, this is more like a feeling thing. It's, you know, I'm not really that funny. I more have funny stories and funny things that happen to me. Sure. And funny people that I meet. Yeah. Like Vlad. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, Vlad was definitely a character. I do not know what kind of crowd we're getting, man. I have no idea. My five have already, um, 
my wife was going to come with her friends, the laugher, and she's not coming, but we still let's go friend the laugher. Oh, and then they come rolling. My name is Jim Roth. I started the Comedy College in 1999 after taking a class myself. And uh, I don't know if you read some of these sheets of paper on the uh, tables tonight, but some of my students have had some really great success. Some people have been on Jimmy Fallon, HBO, and so it's been really cool. And it's been really uh, grateful for me, too, because I get to live in a very upscale neighborhood. Um, I live in West Dallas, and uh, she was laughing before I even said West Dallas. She knew I was from West Dallas, I think, that's for sure. Uh, but we got a lot of people coming to stage tonight. And I took a class in 1996, and I didn't think I was going to be able to do it. And I was going to perform at the old comedy cafe down on Water Street there and uh, Brady and Water. And so I went to the lakefront, and I pulled my car over to the side of the road. And I thought, hell no, I cannot do this. I cannot, you know. And then I remembered I had a bunch of friends and family coming out to the show. So I thought either I can do five minutes of humiliation <laughs> or a lifetime, right? So I, ch I chose the five minutes and the, the rest is history. So here we are tonight. Uh, can we get a big round of applause for everybody you're going to see? Neil McCumber! All right, all right. Um, this next performer, uh, we met last fall. She took an improv class. Every once in a while we do one of those here. And uh, she's going to do her first stand-up. But you, the bonus for me is I make a lot of friends. And in that time, she became a good friend with me. And so make some noise for Miss Glennis White. <laughs> experiences. I like doing new things. So uh, a couple weekends ago, I did something new. I went to Pride Parade in Milwaukee. Yeah. So uh, let's give it up for all my LGBTQ friends out there. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. I'm an ally. I support you. I see you. Uh, so at the Pride Parade, they, they're passing out candy. And they're also passing out condoms. I noticed... Um, out of the two, one tastes like plastic and the other one tastes like cherry. <laughs> the candy tastes like plastic. <laughs> now, you may be thinking, Glennis, how did you know that the condoms taste like cherry? Well, it's because I tasted it. <laughs> You probably noticed throughout this night, like I was doing some voices, like I, I like I like doing voices, um, and it's real easy for me to do, because I just do the voices that are in my head. <laughs> well, I don't actually hear voices in my head. Uh, that's because I'm on antipsychotics. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Who has two thumbs and crazy? This girl. Yeah, so you may be wondering, Glennis, what do you have to do to get on antipsychotics? Well, I'll tell you. You have a doctor who's like, you're crazy. And then they send you to a psychiatrist. And you get down and you tell the psychiatrist all your symptoms. And you're like, yeah, I think I'm stable. I'm as stable as a teeter-totter. I'm like, up, down, up, down, up, down, down, down. Up. And then I'm crazy. I fly off the handlebars. And so they're like, all right, antipsychotics it is. Um, and they give you the script, and you take it for a couple weeks, and, of course, and it doesn't do anything at first. And then after a while, they're like, hey, this fog is, is gone. I'm like thinking clearly now for like the first time. I'm clarid and clear. <laughs> So I, I go into, uh, so six weeks later, I come back, I have the reval, and, and I come back and I tell the, the psychiatrist, I'm like, I'm cleared and clear. And she's like, oh, you know, I'm telling her about how I'm doing, and she's like, you know what, for a, back, for a lack of better words, you seem normal. 
And that was the greatest compliment I have ever gotten. <laughs> A psychiatrist called me normal. <laughs> yep, I'm Glennis White. Thank you. You guys have been a wonderful audience. Awesome. Put your hands together for Miss Glennis White. All right, we're going to keep it going. Make some noise for Tony Cooney. Hey, hey, hey. All right, thank you all for coming out here. I'm Tony Cooney. And, uh, well, this is my first time. Uh, one buddy I remember, uh, Vlad. Uh, later on, we moved in as uh, roommates. Uh, Vlad was Vlad was super funny. Uh, he uh, he always came up with these little things. Uh, uh, like uh, one time we were eating some falafel, and he's like, you know, you know, I think uh, Tony, you know, I think every country has a burrito. He's like, you know, they have a falafel in uh, in Italy. They have a ravioli. And then in Russia, they have a pierogi, they have raniki, and, uh, you know, in, in uh, Greece, you know, they have the gyros, and, and uh, you know, in America, they have the hot dog. So, <laughs> no, the hot dog, hot dog is an American burrito, so. And, uh, <laughs> it's like, it's like a, a good business. I'm on the strip club up there, so take care of it. And, uh, you know, everyone thinks, you know, a strip club, it's fun, but, but you don't think I was here. My mom owned it, okay? And my sister worked there. Okay? And um, so, and I'm supposed to run it and, uh, you know, what, like train my sister on, you know, how to dance. And, uh, um, you know, it worked out well. She was, she was the star of the place. Uh, she basically looked like me, but with longer hair. And, uh, you know, she, you know, she, you know it's, it's pretty hot. It's pretty, she told my, um, told me to go to my dad and say, hey, I'm making dinner. Tell your dad there's fur burgers for dinner. <laughs> I'm like, ew, you know, it's kind of gross. I didn't really know what she meant. So I went over to my dad and I told him, hey, there's fur burgers for dinner. And I'm sad and I'm like, I don't want any of that. <laughs> and uh, well, later on, it's kind of an acquired taste. <laughs> but, uh, but my dad, then, you know, he told my mom, he told me, you know, go tell your mom, we're having tube steak for dinner. <laughs> now that sounded good to me, I was like, steak? You know, wow, <laughs> steak. And, uh, it's not the same. <laughs> um, yeah, they, uh, no, it's not the same at all. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how are you? It's you Jim. Like it's actually Jim. My sister's favorite. You're the one who made me land the books. Yeah. I love right those on. books. Here. Yeah. yeah, I came to see you guys. I want to see you guys today. I'm I want to see, see how things have been going. How have things been going for you? Good. Good. We love those It's clear to see. Do you guys get to hang out with Dad today? Yeah. Do you love From hanging out with your dad? Because she can't stay at home, so she can't Oh, we can sit ah, I see. So she needs us to stay with her to be able to live there. Yeah, I see. Because it's a family homeless shelter. Do you guys like it? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's cool. But, I can't. but she goes pretty slow. She has yeah. I have to go fast. So, have you seen the Amanda books? What do you like about them? Um, that they have people who are not to do stuff. Yeah. Like, my mom's Sometimes you need to go and take a step back. When, when you first got the books, did Daddy read with you? Yep. Did you like when Daddy read with you? Yep. When I asked if there was a book two, he said yes. And when I asked if there was a book three, he said yes. And if he, and then when I asked if there was a book four, he said maybe. <laughs> and then there was a book four. <laughs> and I really like this one. 
Do you know anybody with an addiction? Um, Daddy. Daddy has addiction. And he's getting help, right? And he's working on it. Yep. Ain't it great when Daddy's doing well? Yep. And Mom? Sometimes he needs to go to meetings to help. Yeah. That's why he goes to all those meetings. That's a big part. Yeah, that's part of recovery. This is where Amanda is asking the questions. Oh, yeah. Can you answer some of those questions? Do you remember what a treatment center is? It's a place where people go to get help, right? Go to get help. On a certain size Addiction is a disease in the brain. Wow. You are really smart. Let me ask you a question. So, if somebody has an addiction, what should they do? They should try and get help as fast as they can. A loving husband, a devoted dad. John was battling the bottle, and he was losing bad. Stumbled in one day, asked his daughter to play. She looked up and said, Daddy, I don't like you this way. As tears ran down her face. And in that moment, he knelt at her side. He said, I'm sorry for making you cry. He never touched the bottle again. That's what happens when love is stronger than the man. Out of money, deep in the hole, the day shift ends. Long hours mining coal Rusty calls his wife Says they offered overtime Then rides the black rail car Back into the mine For the third straight night And in that moment He needed sleep but the rent's past due And the kids need to eat He kept on going When he could barely stand Cause that's what happens When love is stronger than the man The world on his shoulders He paid what it cost but When he walked through the street and carried that cross and in that moment he was in pain body shaking under the strain to give a gift that no one else can yeah that's what happens when love is stronger than a man yeah, that's what happens when love is stronger than the man.